Hey listeners, so today for you we have Lester Ho. Lester is a weightlifting coach from Melbourne, Australia. He is a gym owner, Southeast Strength, which uh, focuses on weightlifting and powerlifting. And he's a really knowledgeable guy when it comes to um, the Olympic lifts. Lester did, uh, he studied biomechanics at university and then went on to do his PhD in the snatch. That's right, he's doing a PhD in the one movement, the opening movement of the two movements, uh, the snatch. So, as you can imagine, he's got some pretty good information and, uh, and some pretty good theories on how weightlifting should be, uh, should be done. So, anyway, it was a great chat. I just actually really uh, felt like I, I, I gained a new friend at the end of this chat. Me and Lester had known each other for a long time, but it was kind of like a, hey, Lester, hey, Bill, how are you? Handshake, bit of a nod, maybe a quick chat. We came from the same weightlifting club, um, but I never really got to know him. Moment I walked, uh, moment Lester walked through the door, we, uh, we started chatting and just got on like a house on fire. This is all off camera. We ended up talking about his family and because uh, his little one's been sick and what family really means to you. And just kind of straight off the bat got the feeling that Lester was a really, really just a good guy. And um, you'll see in this conversation with myself and Tommy and Lester that, um, that he was a fantastic guy. Uh, we had a great chat and looking forward to uh, bringing it to you guys. So have a listen up. This is the first of a two-part interview with Lester. He's got lots of knowledge on the Olympic lifts, coaching athletes, um, getting the best out of your athletes, getting your best out of yourself. So um, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Anyway, we have sponsors. First sponsor is Audible. Audible is an online audiobook warehouse with over 250,000 audiobooks and um, it's a great service. So I recently have listened to a number of audiobooks. Listened to Animal Farm the other day while I was bored. Pretty weird, I know. I listened to Marching Powder. We just interviewed Rusty Young. It hasn't come out yet, but we interviewed Rusty Young, the, uh, the author of Marching Powder. I'd already read the book in years, pre, in years prior, one of my all-time favorite books, but I thought I'd freshen up for the interview with Rusty, which was so much fun. Um, so I just read Marching Powder. Can't recommend that more highly. Um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, The Bulletproof Diet, The E-Myth Revisited. Of, um, I listened to Sam Harris's Waking Up, so all about spirituality and consciousness. Um, really interesting listen and it's all through Audible. So Audible's rad. If you want to check out um, Audible and get a free a free 30-day trial with one free audiobook, you can head to www.audibletrial.com forward slash ADVF radio. So head there, um, sign up and um, yeah, get some audiobooks in. And we are also brought to you guys by Adventure Fit Travel. So, Adventure Fit Travel, all that I would like to say today and this week about um, Adventure Fit Travel, uh, Travel is that we have our Everest Base Camp trip coming up this September and that you guys should jump on board. I did Everest Base Camp, I led both trips last year and it's just, uh, it's just a really amazing part of the world. Um, the trip runs 20th of September to the 4th of October and it's just a really good time to get over there if you've been meaning to... Um, Go and check out the Kumbu region, check out the Everest region. Then now's the time because the Nepali people are still a little bit, um, they're still struggling a little bit after the earthquake and their economy runs on tourism. So not only would you help eventually travel by selling tickets and making my life better, but also it's a, it's a really good time to back the Nepali, um, back everybody in over there and, uh, and keep the, keep it all, keep it all running smoothly for them and, Keep the economy um, churning along. So, check out www.adventurefittravel.com. Check out our Everest Base Camp trip. It's a trip of a lifetime. You guys would absolutely love it. Um, other than that, that's it. Here's Lester. Okay, guys. Here we are. We're sitting with uh, with Lester Ho. He was just uh, telling me all about his experience in uh, in weightlifting and the study of weightlifting and I realized we weren't recording yeah. <laughs> so we started again I was but getting before, worried for a second there <laughs> it's alright before we uh, before we introduce Lester properly we'll um, as usual go to Tommy and we'll get Tommy's tribute excellent welcome aboard Lester thank you uh, now are you a Beatles fan buddy chance ah uh, yes my dad loves the Beatles oh, right. oh, good. He, how about you <laughs> uh, I do listen to them as well and uh, you know I grew up with him playing his records waking me up every morning so, beautiful yeah all right, well, I've, uh, I've covered Dave Tripper. 
And I learnt it last night at about 12 o'clock. So <laughs> we'll see how we go. All right. And a one, and a two, and a three. Lester, he's a coach at Southeast Strength. Lester, he'll help you with your. (laughs) 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 It's all right, it's all right. Let me start this one again. All right. (laughs) Sorry, It's all right, you had six six hours of practice. Yeah, that's right, yeah. I'm going to go a little bit slower to see if I can figure this out. Now I've got it. Here we go. Here we go. Lester, he's a coach at Southeast Strength. Lester, he'll help you with your squad in great length. He is an Asian sensation, a one-way ticket man. He is the man to talk to when you're down. So turn that frown upside down. Lester. This is terrible. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's pretty awesome. He actually. started the training geek. Lester. He'll teach you how to tweak. He is an Asian <laughs> sensation. <laughs> there he is, a one-way <laughs> ticket man. He is the guy to talk to when you're down. So turn that frown, Bill. Upside down. Dude. <laughs> Alrighty, welcome uh, aboard, mate. After ten years. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's good, man. That's good. Oh, Thank you for that. Thank you. No for that. worries. That was um, probably uh, the most appalling tribute I've ever yeah, done. Yeah, probably, <laughs> I, I love him. I love him. Uh, Rain, hail, or shine. But that one did, it was probably uh, your roughest one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. So, Lester, welcome to the show. Yes, thank you. Um, thank, thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. So, um. So you're doing your PhD in the snatch. That's insane. So tell us a little bit about that. Uh, okay, so I'm actually looking at uh, the biomechanics of the snatch, looking at specifically joint angles, uh, joint velocity, so joint extension velocity. I know this sounds a bit dry. You know, it's like a lecture that I'm going to give to you. But mm-hmm. um, I'm also looking at comparing different individuals. Uh, I don't have a very big number of individuals, which is a downfall. But, you know, it allows me to say that if I can make a few comparisons and go, oh, this guy lives like that and this guy lives like that and they're not really the same, you know, then in terms of our coaching practice, we kind of need to be a bit more specific to what body types there are and that's mm-hmm. what I've been all about. Like, if you read my stuff, I basically talk about, oh, you are a person with a long torso and that's what you need to do. So I'm just trying to find some research or data mm-hmm. that kind of paints that picture for me. You know, it's more like a, it started off as an academic thing where I want to do, uh, I want to go into academics and be more like a biomechanist. But now, putting it into coaching and seeing how it actually gets applied towards coaching, it's become more of an interesting for me to do a PhD instead of just oh I want to, I want to be a lecturer or yeah. a tutor or anything like that. So yeah. it's really really interesting, and that's why um that's why we've got you on the show. Obviously, it's not often that you uh, you speak to someone who's doing a full PhD. <laughs> In the movement, the snatch, but that goes to show you how intricate the sport of weightlifting is. That you can uh, actually find that data and put that much time and effort into the, the content, doing a PhD on one movement, the first uh, first lift. So, um, so that's great. So let's go back to the start. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Lester, um, your your uh, your background, and um, and what got you into the sport of weightlifting. All right. So um, I basically I'm actually <coughs> from Singapore. You know, uh, I. After finishing my national service, probably at the age of 20, meaning going to the army and all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff, uh, I I did the really boyish thing and said, oh, where is my girlfriend going for her studies? And I said, all right, I'll follow her. Mm-hmm. You know, So I did some research. I said, what could I actually study? What could I actually do? I was in between because being in the army was more of a physical thing and I, I enjoyed like physical training and I was like, oh, how does the body work? You know, how do I actually improve people's capabilities to push themselves further? Uh, Because I was actually a trainer in the army. Yep. And at the same time, before that, I was more into the arts. So I was actually, I actually did like a lot of art history. I did a lot of um, 
art related stuff like painting and sculptures right. and things like that cool you know so i was like should i go into more of the creative side the arts or should i go more into the science side uh to learn more about the body and then i said ah let's try let's try doing the science bit because i've done enough of the art stuff mm-hmm. so mm. um went on to look for a degree in exercise science that i could do uh found one at acu where, which is where i'm doing my phd now mm-hmm. came over spent some time with my girlfriend and we never left like we've been here for like i think she's been here for 12 i've been here for 10 years mm. well yeah. um and yeah so I got into weightlifting basically from my studies. You know, yep. we, we learned the snatch and the clean and jerk with as part of our curriculum, and you know that at that same time, one of my lecturers was actually a lifter at Phoenix. You know, who was that? Ah, uh, Morgan, Morgan Williams. You probably haven't seen him because by the time you got in, he mm. le- he's left. No, so, I don't know any. Ah, uh, Rob, Rob will know him. Like he and Rob are really close, and um, you know, I still chat with him. He he's actually one of my supervisors in my PhD. So okay, ah, uh, he's the one who actually pushed me to do weightlifting. So the the at that time the the school gym was really small. It's like this underground basement thing, and then um you would see him there, you know, when he's training in his tights. Yeah, you know, and at that time nobody knew how to wear tights. Yeah, <laughs> he was the only one who had like skins with holes on them. And yep. you know, you're like, what's this big guy I've, doing? I felt uh, I felt really proud when <coughs> when my skin started to get their holes, ah. uh, their weightlifting holes yep. around the quads. Yep. I walked in and all the boys got these big. <laughs> like, I'm like, man, they've done so many cleans and so many snatches in that, or so many um, cleans in those shorts. And I just felt like a real newbie until I got my holes in my <laughs> <laughs> lifting pants. Is it like a way of so like when you get your black belt? Yeah, in, in, in white thing, you've, yeah. uh, you've got your holes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, nice. Any holes go. The, the challenge now, the challenge now is your trackies. You know, you got to get yes. a hole in your trackies. So yeah, that's yeah. it. That's I when think, you know um, you're a real white. <laughs> yeah. I think in CrossFit, you know, you're a CrossFitter when you do an injury. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah, but so from there, you know, uh, he got me interested in lifting, and you know, uh, after I was done with my three years in the in my undergrad. I was like at a crossroads again and I was like thinking, what should I do? You know, because a uh, exercise science degree is actually very general. You know, you get you get to learn biomechanics, you get to learn exercise physiology, but at the end of the day, how are you gonna apply it? Mm. You don't have that niche yet. Correct. So so he he said, you know, why don't you do some research? Why don't you try doing some research? And I was actually quite interested in it because on my last semester for my third year, I actually did a research project. And that started the whole path of me going into the research uh, career where I did my honours and that was also on the biomechanics of the snatch, looking at the start position specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, halfway through that, while I was collecting data, he introduced me to the guys at Phoenix because uh, I needed some people to come in and, you know, be trial subjects. Yep. Uh, and, you know, he went on to say, why don't you just learn lifting? learn how to lift properly, learn, do, go to a weightlifting club and experience what it's like because now you're being involved in the sport. Mm-hmm. So I stepped in, met Rob. You know, Rob took me in, said... This is Rob Cabas for the listeners uh, that don't know who Rob is. Rob was one of our past um, guests on the show. Yes. Correct. So Rob was uh, Rob was Lester's coach. Yes, and my uh, all-time mentor, you know, and from there I never stepped out of Phoenix. Yep. You know, uh, even to this day, even though I have my own gym, I still credit everything to him. I still credit everything to the times that I had at Phoenix because, you know, you've been there and you know like what it's like to have that kind of, uh, I would say, I'll call it a brotherhood. It's my happy place. Yeah. That's exact. Brotherhood yes. is not how I refer to it. That is, <laughs> no, 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 but in all seriousness, but that is exactly how I feel. Yeah. That is exactly how I feel. Yeah. So, you know, you go there, you catch up with people. Suddenly, you're, you for that one or two hours, you're, anything else in the world doesn't matter. Mm. You know, mm. all you care about is your lifting and your guys there and helping them out and training together, you know. So, so from there, I... I went on to get more interested in weightlifting, competed for probably three years before I said, hmm, let me give, a, give it a shot coaching because mm-hmm. I was learning more about lifting. I was doing my research. I had data. I wanted to see if I could apply it, you know, and then I, at the same time, I was a personal trainer, yep. you know, because after I'd done my undergrad, I was qualified to be a personal trainer and, you know, I, I used some of the lifts to teach regular people how to get fit and get strong. Mm-hmm. You know, and I I went on to say maybe it's time to do my level one, learn how to coach people, you know, get their accreditation, and 
you know, it just started from there. And so why the snatch over the clean and jerk? Uh, well, if you screw up your snatch, you basically are off the competition, mm. Mm. you know. So that I think, uh, and it's also a more technical lift. Definitely. You know, if you think about it, it's one movement from the ground up overhead and there's no time for you to kind of mark it up. Whereas in the clean and jerk, you get it to your shoulders and at least you can kind of reset yourself mm -hmm. to try to get it overhead. So... Uh, you have a you you have a better chance for it to, you know, make a little bit. You have a bigger margin for error in the clean and jerk. Yes. Whereas in the snatch, you know, if you muck it up, you muck it up. Yeah. Yes. You yeah. can you can you can brute strength a clean can, yeah. to save yourself, and yep. and you can't in the in the snatch. In snatch. Yeah. For so, sure. So so did you um, did you go into weightlifting as an athlete to become a better coach? Because are you you're not. Competing? Are you competing these days? I know you're, nah. you're doing some training, but you're not yeah, competing. Like, I'm not how's com it work? I'm not competing anymore, but in the past, I just love... I, I mean, at the beginning, I was more like a lifter. <clears throat> I just wanted to lift, and I really enjoyed pushing myself because uh, to a level where, you know, I was... I wasn't competitive, but, you know, I just like trying to get better in terms yeah. of myself yeah like like everyone like everyone, everyone should be yeah uh, right. i tell this all the time whenever i do a podcast but people don't believe me that when i say i'm actually i was a national i was a former national 10 pin bowler really yeah <laughs> really that is awesome <laughs> yeah so obviously the next move is weightlifting uh, right. yeah 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 uh, is that like uh is that like celebrity status in nah. singapore or uh, it, <laughs> you know how some because so there's some nations oh. where if you type you ping pong yes you know, you're, you're a national you're, hero in, yeah hey, in canada if you're a curler you get the ladies yeah you get the girls man that's true <laughs> no, but uh at my time it wasn't that big a spot yet you know it was still developing but yep. you know me and my wife we were both national bowlers and we we kind of got into the sports scene from there. Like really? I started when I was eight and I've never stopped bowling till I was like 16 or when I got into the army because, you know, you can't train in the army in terms of a national sport unless you're always a national athlete. Yep. So, you know, I... Plus, there I, wouldn't be too many bowling alleys <laughs> kicking around in oh, the they're army. Quite a, they're quite a lot now. There are? Yeah, oh, wow. they're quite a lot now. Really? So, so, My apologies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, it actually... Bowling is a very big sport in Singapore, mm. and, you know, because we've cool. we've produced quite a few world champions and all that. So, um, yeah, so you know well, how to you know how to dedicate yourself. Put it that way. You know yeah. how to dedicate and set goals and exactly and drive for something. You know, and because bowling is also very technical. You know, yeah. in order for Super you to get technical. in order for you to it's like a like it's a repetitive movement, and you know, it 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 has the same aspects as weightlifting, where you know you need a certain amount of strength, you need a certain amount of technique, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, there's a lot of science behind it, yeah. you know, and um, I saw that as a good transfer to weightlifting. Mm. Only thing was, it was unilateral, so I'm yeah. actually I'm actually already lopsided. Yes, and then I'm trying to go into a bilateral movement. Yeah, but you know that's that's the beauty of it. I get to try to fix my body up and see how I go, how far I can go with that. You know, so that was actually what got me into being a lifter, and from there, like I said, I was a trainer and I was you know, implementing whatever I learned as a lifter um, slowly. And that then naturally grew into a process of me becoming a coach. Yeah. You know? Okay. So what was the what was the moment that you decided that you wanted to take your coaching more seriously? Was it just a, was it just a time thing? Was it how many hours do you have in the day? Or because did it happen around the Southeast Strength when you started your own, no, your own gym? No, no. So it actually... Like I was just telling Tom when I just got in, um, I I I had a garage gym. Mm -hmm. So apart from Phoenix, I also had a place where I could train and I was practicing stuff and all that. And yep. I said, you know, and it, like I said, it was a gradual progression. Um, I I wanted to I wanted to see whether I could actually do what Rob did. You know, I mean, I'm not gonna be as good as him or half the man that he's gonna be or he is. But, you know, I wanted to see if I could actually try to bring weightlifting to almost anyone. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't have to be someone that is looking to be the top guy in the world, but someone who just wants to try something different, someone who wants to get strong, yep. someone who wants uh, a, a different taste of training. Yeah. Uh, and that was my intention, you know, because I was writing so much about it, you know, in terms of my PhD, my blog. Yep. Uh, and I said, you know, 
why don't I try seeing if people would be interested in weightlifting? I want to promote the sport more. Yeah. You know, because it's such a small sport and, you know, I've been given so much from Phoenix. It's time to give some of that back and try to get people involved in the sport so that, you know, Phoenix as a club can slow, slowly grow. That was my intention. Mm. That's interesting. So, um, so now that you are, um, you are a full-time coach, what is it that excites you as a coach? I mean, I, I've got a very limited um, coaching uh, experience of coaching athletes on the platform, but I, I personally, and I'm sure I'm gonna, I'm actually answering your question here, but I, I, um, I had a few athletes that I would coach um, as ollie lifters, and I had one athlete who was a good friend of mine. Uh, his name was Nick, and he's, he wouldn't mind me saying this. He probably listened to the show. His technique was, it was pretty ordinary, and he had a lot of mobility issues, some real serious. Um, uh, some real serious shoulder shoulder stuff, and he just never really was blessed with the skills to be a really good weightlifter. But he was so consistent and, and competitive, and and really driven. And he was working hard on himself. We started to work together, and after about six months, we decided to compete. And he did a, a CrossFit weightlifting comp, and he hit um, six from six lifts for two, like a total. It was like it was like twenty plus kilos for on his total, maybe seventeen kilos yep. on his total, and. I 100% like we were saying before the show with my brother how I, I would ride yep. his failures and successes. I rode my mate Nick's success and 100% it felt as if I just PB'd maybe even more. I mean, yeah. is that the feeling that you get as a coach? Yeah, yeah, exactly that. It's almost like being a parent. <clears throat> yeah. Know? Like, you know, you, you, you take someone in and you try to like nurture them. You try to give them the, the same enjoyment you get, you get from lifting. Yeah. My excitement comes from being able to create that same environment or the same community feeling as what I got out of Phoenix. Mm. That's the reason why I started Selfie Strength because, you know, uh, at that time, I, was, I wasn't training at Phoenix as often as I wanted to be and I wanted to bring that feeling out to people so that they could experience that as well because yep. I really enjoyed it. I yep. mean, for I wouldn't give up anything for it. Like, if it's one of the memories that I've got to lose... It's not going to be. That's going to be the last one. Yeah, that's going to be the last one. Yeah, apart from my family. Yes. Yeah. Well, so. I, I find that fascinating because for me, it's the exact same. I've had some happy places over my over my lifetime. I've had my football club. Um, I had the Rye Back Beaches where I used to surf, but and even if I was stressed, I'd just go down and watch the waves. We'd go and hang out down there when I was really young. But the 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 surf the surfing was just like it was on my doorstep and it was with my friends it was a different kind of scenario football club was good but I never still still with football I never felt 100% comfortable never really felt like everyone was on my side there was always clicky stuff going on there was always bullshit going on with the real footy club culture a lot of the, a lot of times but phoenix has this strange environment where it's got the right amount of the gym let, let's explain phoenix the gym the gym is the size of my kitchen <laughs> Basically, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's super tiny. It's a tiny yeah. gym with um, five or six platforms. Everybody's sharing a platform. All our bumper plates are old and busted, but they're still way around the around the mark. Yep. the bars are good, but it's just a grungy little um, non for profit environment where all the coaches donate their time. But it's just the best place to train. Like, how do you take the good aspects of Phoenix, um, the banter, the camaraderie, the friendship? How? What are the things for you? That you say, all right, I need to take A, B, and C and transfer them into Southeast Strength. I I look at it as fun. You know, the the important thing is you go there and have fun. Yeah. You know, I mean, at the same like you mentioned, you know, even though we have all that banter, we have you know all that um, community aspect to it, and you know, at the end of the day, it's still about training. Mm. You know, when you touch a bar, I always remember if we are touching a bar and we weren't training, Rob would be like. You're already touching the bar. Get moving, you know. Yep. So he knows when to actually pull it back and go. All right, you guys are having too much fun. Get to work, you know. Yep. So mm. I think it's that balance, being able to achieve that balance. Ah, mm. uh, but saying that, I think for me it's more like, I I just want people to enjoy the sport like how we did, you mm -hmm. know, or how how we're doing, you know, whether it's from a a competitive background, whether it's from a recreational background. As long as you enjoy learning how to snatch, you know that you can do this five years down the road, 10 years down the road, 15 years down the road, yep. you know, uh, being able to see a whole different progression, you know, someone who is really young as well as someone who is really old doing the sport, you know, coming together as a community to enjoy weightlifting 
uh, I think that was what I got out of Phoenix, and that's what I'm trying to bring into Southeast Strength. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's um, look if you enjoy anything in life, you're naturally drawn to it, yes. and um, what better way to to enjoy something than something that makes you fitter and healthier and exactly. being around a good group of people? Do you really? Um, you were saying before you're trying to make it fun. What specific things would you do to try and make it, I guess, more oh, fun? I mean, like for us, right, we, I mean, as much as it's about the, the training as well, but, you know, at times we'll try different things out. You know, although we, we pride us not pride ourselves, but we always say that we're a weightlifting gym. Mm. You know, I, I like to sneak in things like conditioning pieces. Oh, yep. today, today in this, or uh, in this cycle for the next three weeks, we'll probably do a, a CrossFit style power clean into a split jerk. Yep. You know, no, no, no rest, no re-racking or resetting. Just go straight into it. So mm-hmm. small little elements like that, where the guys get a small little surprise. Curveball. They go, like, yeah, they go like, that's cool. Oh, oh, shoot, that's something different. You know, yeah, but it's good for the body. That uh, that helps you weightlifting no ends anyway, because it's a good way to teach yourself to respond to different stimulus. Because there's going to be a, a position or a snatch that you're in, you're at the bottom. You see weightlifters come up onto their toes, yep. um, and be able to re- re- um, recover those lifts and so on. Like there's never-ending amount of curveballs that you can be thrown and the more that your body can respond to it you know automatically um i think it's probably probably a good thing yeah hey um just uh on it again in terms of making the environment a little bit more um approachable uh a lot of the time people come into to my gym so I, i'm a coach at a crossfit <coughs> yep. gym and they'll say oh my god there's fucking fit people everywhere i'm so intimidated how do you and i guess it would be the exact same thing as at uh, you know weight there's huge guys huge girls really strong i was people. intimidated when i walked into phoenix yeah. and I'm, <laughs> I was, a, I'm a fully grown man <laughs> yeah i was and i was intimidated oh, you the first time I fully, grown, fully grown boy <laughs> yeah. first time um i walked into a crossfit gym i was so <clears throat> intimidated i'd never seen so many like ripped attractive people in the you know my life like you know apart from looking in the mirror and um <laughs> What would you say to someone that's, you know, sort of interested in getting into weightlifting but is probably a little bit um, discouraged by, by that environment they're walking into? Hey, have you have you seen me? I, <laughs> I'm a skinny... Is that what you'd say? No, I'm a skinny Asian dude with that wears glasses. Has I was going to say, don't forget about the glasses. Yeah, yeah that's right. I'm, yeah. I wear glasses and, you know, what's so intimidating about that? Yeah, you know? I, I was going to mention the glasses. In yeah. the <laughs> I thought it. Yeah, but it's all right. Uh, but, you know, that's what I mean. Like, that's why I, I wanted to create an environment that, that's more welcoming. You know, uh, I tend to try to say that it's a sport that anyone can do. Mm. So I like to show, all right, I have, you know, Milos, for example, from mm. Phoenix, you know, 70 year old guy that's still competing, even yeah. though he's banged up and all legend. that. Yeah, legend. legend. Yeah. Um, and then if he can be doing it, I don't think that's intimidating. You know, I, I make sure I bring my kids in as well. So I make sure I bring uh, my son in to hang out with the, with the guys in the gym, you know, even though, you know, even though we have a powerlifting site where, you know, you always hear heavy metal music and, you know, metal plates crashing and yep. all that kind of stuff. Yep. But, you know, these guys are f- big friendly giants. Yes. You know, you talk to yep. them and, you know, they're so approachable, you know. Um, and, you know, that's, that's basically what we try to do at Southeast Strength where we, doesn't matter what background you come from, you know, at the end of the day, if you can sit down with us, uh, we set up the barbecue, have some meat, you know, uh, drink some coffee, have some donuts. Cool. You know, we that's that's the kind of environment we want to build, and I think that's what people see as welcoming. You mm. know, yeah. they they don't see it as oh we're here and we're gonna smash you and you know we are so strong and you're not. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I I don't I don't see it as that. I mean, everyone starts somewhere. Yeah, you know, everyone, I totally agree. Yeah, everyone starts somewhere. You know, you 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 can't say that oh this guy looks so strong. You got to see how many years did he take to get there. Yep. You know, yep. give give yourself that kind of a timeline, and you know, I I always say to people, it, it's all about putting in the hours. But if you're new to this, you know, take your time. Yeah, yeah. You'll start off slow. Yeah, for sure. So obviously, in what you've just said, you, you you've got a gym that's filled with people of all ages, male and female. Do you find you biomechanically, technique wise, I'm sure you know you're very very well versed in that. We'll go into some of that. But how do you find the difference between um, of dealing with different people, so by different personality types, but also male and female, young and old. Do you have what are some examples of ways that you might you might um, you might treat a young girl that walks into the gym uh, uh, in comparison to a in his prime uh, man, or yep. like how does how do you deal with different people in the gym? Uh, I think I treat it quite a few ways but I tend to categorize it both into a physiology side as well as a psychology side so 
uh, physiology, talking about levers, talking about, you know, how mature your body is, mm-hmm. how many years of training you've done, what kind of training you've, you've done, you know. So these are actually based a lot on strength conditioning principles, you know. You hear about, oh, kids, yeah, if you do too much um, growth resistance, part, growth, yeah, growth plates yeah. get strained and that's how you stun growth. Is that true? Uh, it's true, but that's when, you know, you overwork the muscle. So mm-hmm. basically think about it. It's like you have your muscle and then you have your tendon attachments to the growth plates. So if that muscle gets too tight, basically the tendons don't get change a change in length. They're mm-hmm. pulling on the growth plates and they damage the growth plates. Right. So it's a it's understanding the dose and response of training, you know, not giving them too much. I mean I have a few like fifteen year old boys who are like hitting their growth spurs and you come in every week and you it seems like they're catching up with you in terms yeah. of height and then you go like, Oh, are you growing? And then it's like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but basically they are growing. Yes. You know, but you gotta kinda of manage it and go like, all right, are you sore anywhere? Have you have you feel do you feel like, you know, you've you you strain something all the time, you know? Um, I think that communication is really important with mm. them, being open with them, telling yeah. them that they can be open with you as well. So that's the physiological side. Um ladies compared to guys are more flexible, mm-hmm. you know, so understanding their flexibility, you know, where, how far you can take them in terms of positions, yep. uh, what do you need to do in terms of trying to improve their stability because of that flexibility. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the mental side, you know, I think all the emotional stuff, you know, like um, how to how to push a guy as compared to how to push a girl. Yeah, well, this is what I was more more alluding to. Like yes. how, do you, how do you choose um, how far to push a personality type in training, yep. um, how to push them in their programming that will affect their training and how, say for example, let's use an example of um, you've got a, a male lifter um, who's missed his first snatch or, or, or missing lifts, missing lifts and putting the pressure on yourself to make lifts. I mean, have you had a, how's that learning curve been with starting a gym dealing with all shapes and walks of life? Because there's obviously, uh, everybody's different man like a 30 year old man like myself compared to another 30 year old man like myself we can be totally different i understand yep. that it's not just sexes it's not just age and so forth yep. but like has that been an interesting part, um, part for you learning the psychological tactics of of, of coaching but I, I think it's also sorry just to cut you off there i think it's also understanding the goals of the the athlete as well like you can say Oh, uh, you know, push, push, push. But it's like if someone doesn't really want to push, and they're just there for fun. Like, what? Yeah. What? Exactly. Why are you saying that? Yep. And you know, that's the thing. Like, um, like I, because I mean, I haven't been in weightlifting for like thirty <clears throat> years. Like Rob, for example. Yeah. You know, so I don't have the experience of physically working with that many people or seeing that many lifts. This is what I always say. Rob probably has seen like ten million lifts and worked with like so many lifters. You know, like he can just snap his fingers and tell you, oh, this is what I actually experienced and he can pull pull it out of his memory bank. Yeah. Whereas for for me, I come from a background of like having a little bit more of the principles of training that I learn within my studies, you know, mm-hmm. within my research, you know. I read a lot and, you know, I go like, all right, periodization, this is how it works, you know. Um, strength training, this is how you, you know, you can manipulate the variables for you to achieve that so a lot of my ideas are based off principles first of all mm-hmm. and then trying to apply that principle gives me the experience you know if it doesn't work i'll try something else mm-hmm. you know i'm not afraid to try something else you know so so th- going back to that you know comparing let's say i have 230 year old guys that come in and you know they are of maybe um they are of different backgrounds someone can be a little bit more on the shy personality and Someone can be a bit more of that outgoing personality that's always competitive, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, then I fall back to what I learned in exercise psychology, you know, yeah. how to how to deal with how to deal with motivation, you know, how to motivate someone to to actually like the guy who's outgoing will probably have to tone his tone himself down so that he knows that he can remain composed. Mm-hmm. Whereas the other guy, I need to kind of fire him up a little bit. Mm-hmm. So this is it falls back to you being able to understand personality types, learning styles even. You know, yeah. some guys are more visual. Auditory. Yeah, auditory or, auditory or sensory. even yeah, sensory. So, so, you know, you like all these comes from reading and then you seeing how it gets put into place as an as a individual or how it gets applied as a coach. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's trial and error. You know, mm. you, you, know you, you, you can have a very solid um, 
background in all these strength conditioning principles, but at the end of the day, you know, you, you apply it and it may not work to the individual, you got to try something else. Yeah. You know? I think um, at the end of the day, we sort of all agree as coaches that you do have to be a good people person. You have to be able to convey something to someone and be able to recognize that if it's not working, like you just said with someone that we have to change things up and we have to, you know, think about ways we can get around it. But um, it's, yeah. You also have to be a good sounding board as well. You have to be, you have to be, yeah. a, a, you just have to be a friend. You yeah. know, you can, you can, you can help people's performance by simply hearing what went so wrong with their day and their week. And, you know, you have that real intimate relationship with somebody, I think can, um, you know, that they can kind of use you as a bit of a, uh, an, a outlet. System. Yes. an outlet, I suppose. I, I think the important bit as well is because, you know, like for us, we are all very young coaches and the people we work with are around our age as well. They come to you for a reason because, you know, you have the expertise as a coach. Uh, at the same time, you want to be able to keep that balance as much as you want to be a friend, right? They, you need to be able to, you need to be able to have that that uh, assertiveness of saying, "I know what I'm doing for you." Yeah, you know, trust absolutely. that process, and you know, um, you know, give me like give me that ability to, to give me your trust. Yeah, give me your trust. Yeah. You know, to bring you up as a lifter or you know help you out with that. You know, if you're feeling like shit, I can explain to you why you're feeling like shit mm. and. You know, it's just a it's just a phase that you probably have to work through and be consistent with your training and come back from it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Absolutely. Hey, Lester, I wanted to ask you something. Just moving on, um, we mentioned before dealing with older athletes. Um, obviously, as people get older, um, tissues start to wear and tear, get tighter, and especially what we're seeing now with you know there is a move towards functional training. Yes. All these older athletes that are coming into it have, you know, super tight shoulders or super tight hips from from sitting down and, and all that sort of stuff. Let's say uh, person A walks into uh, to Southeast Strength and goes, "Hey, I want to uh, I want to be able to, you know, I want to snatch 100, clean jerk 120 kilos." But uh, he's been sitting down for 30 years of his life and he's he's super tight. What's some of the the first things you look at doing? Uh, uh, with so a? so basically, I always follow this framework that I have and I teach during my seminars. Uh, it's basically uh, something I picked up from Diane Fu when I when I when we did seminars in the US together. Uh, and we were promoting this as well. Uh, I always start with position, and position involves range of motion and awareness. So I do a simple test of the overhead squat, and I go, if you're able to overhead squat properly, I'll be able to tell what's going on in terms of your body. You know, uh, the overhead squat allows you to look at the shoulder complex, the hip complex, and even the ankle complex. Mm, high heels, yeah. absolutely. So those three things are the ones that are going to affect a lot of your positions within your, your weightlifting movements. So if, you know, I see that his shoulders are tight because he's been sitting down all the time and he's like anteriorly uh, rounded forward, yes. you know, all, all our goal is, all right, what we need to do is firstly, loosen up those structures, get the correct muscles firing up. So particularly in the back, in the upper back, so that you kind of hold your posture a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Saying that, if that is something that you will probably take like, 10,000 years to fix. That's what I was, was going to ask yeah. because, what sort because, of time frame do you put on? Yeah. Oh yeah, I'll just, I'll just take a hammer out and chisel and yeah, uh, yeah, just break yeah, yeah, him. Yeah. Nah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, if that's the case, then we have to like, kind of look at what other, what other positions he can be put in that still structurally sound. Mm -hmm. So if someone is rounded in, forward in the shoulders, right, and you know that's not really a good position to receive in that overhead squat, Okay, how can I actually make this a safe position? Would it be more of trying to get him to feel like he can squeeze his shoulder blades a little bit better? Or is it rotating his elbows a little bit more? You know, small little things like that mm -hmm. that allow him to be in a good position still. So that's why this is where, you know, my background in biomechanics come in. You you get to see, you know, you draw everything in lines and figure uh lines and angles. You, know, you can see, all right, the center of mass is here. Everyone becomes a stick figure for me. Okay, he looks like this now. How can I arrange that so that it looks a little bit more, uh, looks like a safer structure? Yeah. And then look at what I can I can actually pinpoint to try to fix it up. You know, could so, you, is, is it fair to say you could, if someone's got really tight shoulders and, and they're really struggling with the overhead squat, and their shoulders just aren't making any leeway, you could alleviate that problem from working on the dorsiflexion 
which would maybe open up that yes. that torso to be to be able to Dead still control well. control a load overhead. So being able to find other ways rather yes. than the affected that that can't be changed to to get them in a exactly. workable position, I suppose. Exactly, it's the same as you know how you see a lot of guys or masters athletes come in and they are rounded, yeah. right in the upper back, you know, and then you go like, oh, that's not really a good position to be pulling from. Mm. You know, so how do you actually keep the bar closed? Because if your shoulders are rounded forward, the bar is always sitting in front. Yep. You know, so what can you do to actually try to keep the bar closed? Things like turning your elbows in mm-hmm. or out because your shoulders are already rounded. So, mm-hmm. you know, knuckles down, knuckles down, uh, curl the wrist a little bit so yep. that that stays a little bit closer. Mm-hmm. You know, small little things like that that can be adjusted to technique that allows them to kind of feel, feel the the elements of a good lift mm, you know, yeah. the ability to transfer force from the legs to the bar you know? yeah um, yeah i think that's something as well that as more people sort of get introduced to the sport of weightlifting that not one way works for everyone obviously mm. you know better than yourself are, you know doing um or <laughs> you, you're, you're studying on this that's why we got you on the show <laughs> but uh you say you know better than yourself yeah you know better than <laughs> that anyone else no, i am getting so many things wrong this morning <laughs> you know better than myself, had an irish coffee every morning yeah. uh, I think 10 this morning. Nine, yeah, yeah that's right I about 20 <laughs> so i'm on no but um yeah it's really interesting you say um say things like that because as a coach um if i saw someone who had you know, really sort of internally rotated shoulders. The first thing I would go was like, oh shit, we don't want that to happen when you're receiving the bar. So let's let's focus on that. Yep. But um, it's cool that we can sort of look at other structures as well to alleviate some of that because we're not sure if they could be causing that. You yep. know, it's interesting. I like it. I'll mm. give you another example. Like take someone who has really tight hips and ankles for it. Right when you know, like when you set up in a in a snatch, mm-hmm. you probably have to have your hips down a little bit more. You know, be able to sit your knees forward a little bit more, mm-hmm. and be in a good position to come off the ground in a using your legs. You know? Yeah. Yes. But someone who is really tight probably can't sit the hips down as much. So what do you do? Keep the hips higher, right? And let him maybe even start like in a slightly more inclined position. Like a deadlift you know, pull. Like deadlift pull, mm-hmm. you know. But then you teach him to actually try to feel his legs from there. You teach him, you know, do things like to strengthen his back up, you know, so that he is actually able to hold that position. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know? rather so, than his butt shooting up. Yeah, rather than his butt shooting up. So, so you know, you you firstly, you work on the the positions. Then you can go like, all right, this is, this is a position you need to be in. Your back's not really strong. So we need to do a lot of things to strengthen up your back so that you can actually work with this position. Mm-hmm. You know? And are you doing that while you're trying to get the range in his hips so that yes. he can sit lower? Yes. Yeah, cool. So in between that, you know, unless, uh, to be honest with you, this is, this is something I got from Kelly Starrett. He said that um, any soft tissue structures apparently takes 18 weeks of okay. consistent you know oh, right. work so it takes 26 to 30 weeks of the work that people will actually put in yeah, yeah. Do you have problems with that like how do you get people to actually put in the work stick to the program uh, stick to the program you know do important things like I mean you get you get that spectrum guys who do too much yeah, yeah, yeah. and guys who do too little yep. you need to be right in the middle be able to go like alright I, I do enough of mobility stuff or I know what I need to do in terms of my mobility yeah um but I tend to put it in the program and I also like to go, all right, I like to I like to show them, you know, it's like it's like a kid making a mistake. All right, this is what you did wrong, or this is why you can't do this because your body's stuck like that. Mm. So how you need to actually solve that problem so that you can move better. Yeah. You know? Um and then they, they realize, oh, that makes sense. As long as something makes sense. Yeah they are more motivated, mo- motivated to, to work over it. For Definitely. sure. Definitely. For sure. I think um, before we kick on too long, just in case you have to go get yourself tattooed today, Tommy. Yeah. Let's oh. get into the... Um, I'm really enjoying this. This is, I want to get delved deeper. Yeah. Let's, let's, um, let's try and not... Maybe the both of us I'm talking, let's not... I reckon we, we get the quick, good, the bad, and the science out. Sure. And then... Um, yeah, we'll, we'll keep going. All righty. So uh, now you listen to our, our Rob Forte show, mate. The good, the bad, and the science is... Uh, we, uh, we, we talk about some current events, something that's good that's happened uh, during the week, something that's not so good that's happened during the week, and then something science because uh, Bill and I love our, our pseudoscience. <laughs> yep. So, uh, the good. So, apparently a man dressed in a T-Rex <laughs> costume 
has uh, dominated the American Ninja Warrior course, just like it's no big deal, okay? <laughs> so if you guys have ever wanted to appear, to appear on American Ninja but feared you wouldn't be allowed to compete, well, uh, a T-Rex has done it. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can definitely... You can definitely jump on that. Now, my question was, after looking at this, if you could be on one TV show, uh, what would it be and why? Oh, It's a tough one, hey? Mm, now, yeah, it's a tough or, one. You've got to think about all those weird Japanese TV shows, that one where uh, they've got like these <laughs> shapes running at them and they've got to like jump through the shape and if yep. they don't jump through the shape, they'll wipeout. fall like a, a pit of goo. Is it Wipeout? Wipeout was sick. Was oh, Wipeout yeah, the yeah. one where the... I mean, Wipeout would be Yeah, wipeout, Wipeout's the one where you have to go through yes. all the obstacles. That looks so and, fun. Yeah. I always thought that I could win Wipeout. Yeah. 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 You'd always see him get clipped in the ankles. You're like, yeah. oh, you yeah. idiot. I could have done that. <laughs> Just do more jump box jumps. Jump you, goose. Uh, he couldn't RX a box jump. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys watch the... There's this Korean like variety show called... Don't Ro- think I watch it, mate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you don't I'm, need to say the name. I'm Asian, right? I'm Asian. So. So, so basically, I, like it's like they have a lot of different missions, and you know they. I don't know how their producers think about show like these missions. They mm, go like, like an amazing race kind of. Yeah, 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 like amazing race kind of thing. Is it the amazing race? No, no, it's not. It's not the right. amazing race. They do like really unique stuff. Like they even have games where you know they have those chairs with hydraulics in it in a swimming pool, and <laughs> you know if they get it wrong, suddenly the chair goes up and they flip like ten meters <laughs> off. That's so awesome. Ahead, you know? <laughs> so so um I. That's one of the shows that I would probably be on. Um, it because you know they go around and they it's fun, fun. They eat a lot of food. Yes, and I'm a food person. Yeah. So my wife's a food blogger. So yep. basically, that's like my dream show. I get to go around and try different kinds of food. That's cool. I like it. All right, the bat. A four foot long snake falls onto driver's feet while she's on the highway. Oh. A four foot snake was apparently living life in the fast lane when an Arkansas woman says it fell out of her car's dashboard and onto her feet last week. This is a quote. As soon as it landed on my feet, I felt it. It was rough and scaly and it slithered across my feet uh, pretty much like nails on a chalkboard. Now, I was sort of thinking about this um, and I read some of the comments and I you know, just if a snake fell on me, of course I'd be I'd be surprised, probably a little bit shocked, but I I wouldn't I wasn't reacting the same way as these people would. So it it begs the question: What would you guys hate mostly to fall on your feet while you're driving down the highway? What do you think? Oh, mine's like uh, those huntsman spiders. Oh, okay. Oh, you know, like the massive ones that. You know, they show all the memes and you have yes. to like take a flame to it. They're the most they're the most textbook ones too. They're always yeah. under the uh, under the sun uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. right. It's a bit sunny today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, come on. Yeah. Come on. It's like stop the Build car, the get out. Yeah. <laughs> dad, get dad, get dad. Uh, I just did my first aid course um yesterday again. Um Again, just want to mention that I have done it before because <laughs> I'm a coach. And uh, the funnel web is the is the most dangerous huntsman in Victoria, especially. Funnel, so the hun- most dangerous spider. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. well, maybe not the most dangerous spider, but oh no, it probably is the most dangerous spider. If you get if you get bitten by a funnel web, you you're in strife. So. Oh. Yeah. So maybe a huntsman's not you know, not your biggest issue. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. Huntsman's don't even hurt you less. Than I don't yeah, think I so. know, but like <laughs> it's just <laughs> filthy it's and hairy. Like, no, but Look it's the sheer <laughs> 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 It's the sheer, the sheer mass of it, you know. Yes, it's like yeah. it's like if you see a tarantula, you go like, "Oh yeah, holy shit, that's quite large." Yeah, that's quite <laughs> large, you know. All right, cool. What do you got for science? All righty. So, sciencey. These treatments could help everything from OCD to Parkinson's. Okay, so they've uh, doctors and scientists. I'm assuming have come up with uh, some new uh, electricity. So, target electricity. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Treatment. That's helped uh, to find new ways to help people with neurological disorders. Um, and this, is, this has been stemming over the past few decades, but it really is starting to come into to light um, currently. So these treatments known as neuromodulation have been effective in medical methods such as deep brain stimulation. Patients are fitted with a brain pacemaker that sends electric jolts to neurons in the brain to ease mobility issues and help control patients with tremors. Now, I actually saw this a couple of years ago and um, they... Uh, they put up an electromagnetic uh, pacemaker, as it says, to a lady that had um, chronic depression. So she'd had depression for 25 years, I think. And just by stimulating different parts in the brain, and it was literally a quick of a, the click of a switch, and the lady would say, oh, I feel so much better now. Because, and, you know, and then they would click it back, and, and she would obviously fall back to where she was. It's weird. She's literally being manipulated and influenced by this. And I think the the pacemaker was connected to parts that release dopamine Means, and yeah. release serotonin. It's it's amazing. It's so so inhuman if you think of it that way. Um, but potentially, you know, super beneficial for for people in in that 
in that scenario. Um, I was going to ask, based on what I just said, do you guys think that uh, it's sort of starting to become unnatural, you know, with what we may see in the future? Um, do, do you think, do you, are you for it or are you against it? Uh, to be honest, I'll probably be for it because, I mean, you know, we we human beings are evolving to a point where we're getting smarter and smarter and we're trying to extend our, our life expectancy as much as possible and, you know, with that many health problems that we we have, uh, being able to counter that allows us to, you know, be able to have benefits like spending more time with the people that we love, you know, so I'm always for it, you know, mm, if I can. Quality, sp- yeah. quality of life as yeah, well. quality as of life, life as well. Life Absolutely. expectancy. And the other thing is, what's unnatural? Well, I mean, I just if, put, if, I mean, you if know. we create it, like say for example, so that's that's a performance enhancing or a health enhancing um, treatment. Treatment. So, what about um, grooming, like apes grooming each other? Well, that's that's. Uh, but well, you, go on to, to to not to not get bitten by ticks and and so forth. That's so apes uh, ourselves probably included way back before before we evolved to where we are now. Well, you and me yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, that's an example that's just come to my head of doing something that's going to benefit you, implementing something that's going to benefit you um, and make you healthier and make you more comfortable, make you have a better quality of life. I mean, for me, there's no real difference. Okay, the well, only thing is one of them's created by a computer, which is created by us. Well, I'll put it to you this you know way. I mean? yeah. They reckon in 30 years' time, an iPhone will be so small, it'll be a little microchip that will implant in our brains. Yeah. And we'll have all that information on our brains. Yes, we do. you agree with that? Or? Yeah, well, they, they, they've doing, they're doing a lot of studies now that are, that are going down that path. And basically, we're going to be... The, the, the whole AI discussion, artificial mm. intelligence, might end up being that we are the artificial intelligence. Basically, we have Google in our brain. Which I think is a whole nother can of worms because I think it will mean that the the established world um, and the, the richer parts of the world will basically become superhuman and then the people that can't afford it and that are left technologically behind will become less than human. I think the, Hugely I think the argument here is like, you know, like if we are looking at it in terms of making us more human than superhuman. Mm. So So if something like that allows us to be more of a human level, more of a normal level, then it's fine. But if it, it gives us that that advantage over someone else, you know, just because we want that, then, you know, is, is it is it really is it really a good thing? Maybe, it, maybe not. It's Ooh. the fork in the road of evolutionary terms. Yeah. Yeah. If, if, we, just, yeah. if we if we go if we ended up having if we have chips in our brains, um, as soon as we get chips in our brains it starts to become the norm ish. Yep. Because there's never going to be everyone in the world that has these chips in their brains that, but, that make us, um, that, that means our brains can function 500 times faster but, than yeah, but, but that's what I mean. Like, you know, take a chip in the brain, for example. If a chip in the brain allows us to function 500 times faster, that's, that's like performance enhancement, yeah. you know. But if a chip in the brain allows us to go like, oh, I've gotten rid of my tremors and I'm actually able to lead a normal life. Perfect. Yeah. Then, then, you know, that's, that's you leading a normal life and being more human. Yeah. You know? But based off what you just said before, I mean, this technology, when it's released to market, is going to be insanely expensive. So only the rich can afford it. Yep. So they're performance enhancing. The, the poor can't afford it. Is that, is, that, is that similar? That's what I mean. So I think there'll be, there'll be only the rich can afford it at some point and then it'll trickle down and only the Western world will be able to afford it. And yep. then I'm not sure how far it will trickle down. And if that's the case, then it's like they say with artificial intelligence, how fast it's going to advance. Then say, for example, and I'm just using today's example because the Western world has the ability to probably do this more so than, than, yes. than others. So then it becomes, I literally believe it becomes the fork in the road that mm. thousands of years in the future, we say that's when we were homo sapiens and that's when this, these, these people became this and yep. these people became this. That's yep. what I really 100% and believe. And look, Based off that, if we're looking at this technology um, in the science, the electromagnetic pacemaker that could potentially cure OCD, Parkinson's, depression, half of the population won't have those issues. Half of the population will. Mm. And that's not human. It's a very, very interesting philosophical mm. 
question, which will need to be answered pretty soon. Uh, when, we get, when you get back in the show, Lester, we'll, uh, we'll have a we'll dedicate it just to that. I think we'll get you back uh, in thirty years and we'll yeah. see. <laughs> yeah. 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 See how far I've gone. You know, what do I have a chip in a brain or do I have a knee replacement or yeah, something? Like that's that, right. You know, and you can snatch four hundred kilos. <laughs> yeah, because of that, you know, yeah. I have like a hydraulic system in a knee. Yeah. I don't even need quads like anymore. You know? yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. But yeah, thanks for that. Um Are you are you sticking around for a little bit longer? I'm probably gonna move. I think I gotta go. Okay, cool. Let's stop. Nice meeting Absolute you. pleasure, mate. Yeah, we'll chat soon again. Yes, yes. Always a pleasure, Bill. See you, mate. Take I'll it I'll see easy. you guys soon. Okay, guys. That was our first of two with Lester Ho. Um, really good guy. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did enjoy it, please tell a friend. Please hit subscribe on, uh, on iTunes. That would be fantastic. Also, if there's anything in the show that we just, uh, that we just listed and you guys want more information about it, you can find it at www.adventurefittravel.com forward slash podcast. So all the selected links, all the people mentioned, everything in, everything in our conversation should be in there for you guys to find anything that you need. Um, yeah, it's all there. Um, also, while you're on our website, feel free to join our mailing list. There's plenty of ways to join the mailing list. There's little pop-up bars everywhere. That way, you'll be across all of our promotions with Adventure Fit Travel and Adventure Fit Radio. You'll also not miss a show. You'll also get the best from our blog and our podcast and lots of other good stuff. No spam, all the good stuff. Um, that's it. Anyway, see you next week. Discovery Roger, go for deploy.